Good morning, everyone. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story that Valerio started this morning, uh, one of the most recent uh, pieces that we're actually adding. And this study was, in fact, led by Valentina Zaffaronica Orsi that is here today, but she kindly let me present this research. So I will start uh, with the outline of the presentation and especially from what we know about pheromone methane disruption, because as Valerio said, this is a technique that has been known for a long time and used in the field for a long time. So there are parallel, parallel aspects with uh, applied biotremology and many things that we can learn from the story of pheromone methane disruption. Then I will just recall a few biological aspects of the model species of Scaphodeus titanus because we already heard about it, but there are some aspects that are, can be a key for this particular uh, research. And I will move on into what are our uh, questions and so what we actually did in the lab and what we got as a result. Uh, and I will conclude with the future perspective and where the future is leading us. So behavior manipulation, we thought about it today a lot, uh, is a pest control strategy which wants to use natural or artificial signals to interfere with some fundamental behaviors of the pest in order to reduce the population density or to completely eradicate the pest from an area. And usually, like for example, in mating disruption with pheromones, that is the most known example, the aim is just to target a specific behavior. So if we use mating pheromones, what we want to avoid is the mating of the insect. So in the case, for example, here in the picture, there is Lobesia botrana, that is the grapevine moth that Valerio also mentioned. Uh, in the region of Trentino in Italy is completely controlled just with pheromones, so there is no need of insecticide anymore. And the male is not able to locate the female anymore, so of course they do not mate. But over the years, researchers found out that actually the use of pheromone mating disruption in the field does not affect only mating, even if the technique was designed with that purpose in mind, but it affects also other behaviors of the species, like for example, the flight activity or the reposition activity. And this is particularly interesting because as someone before raised up during the presentation, there could be also resistance uh, appearing over years of applying the same technique in the field. But if we are targeting more than one behavior, resistance occur, it's less likely that it will occur. And it has been demonstrated that also the effect on the flight activity of Lobesia botrana and the oviposition is part of how the strategy of how methane disruption with pheromones actually works in the field. So Scaphodeus titanus is a leaf hopper and is an invasive species in Europe. Um, and as most leaf hoppers uh, communicate uh, during mating and during reproduction with vibrations. Uh, as Valerio said, it's usually the male that starts calling and if there is no reply, it starts to move around the plant. Um, but what is in interesting for our study is also that this species is strictly linked to the host species, to the host plant, because the entire cycle can only happen on vitis plants, on grapevine plants. So the adults fly and feed and mate on grapevine plants, uh, then during the summer after the mating, the female starts laying eggs into the trunk uh, under the bark of the grapevine plants, and the egg stays there for the entire winter, surviving winter, and then the following spring they will latch and the, the generation will grow. So the, it's important the fact that even if they can move shortly for a limited amount of time on other plants, then they have to go back on the grapevine plants. And they are important 
for the economic <laughs> uh, point of view and for farmers because Scaphidus titanus is vector of phytoplasma that cause fluorescence during grapevine plants. And the way we, and the solutions we have to manage fluorescence during at the moment in Europe is basically eradication. So whenever the phytoplasma is identified in the field for symptoms or uh, analysis in the lab, or wherever the insect is found uh, in the field, then the plants have to be eradicated. It's mandatory. Uh, and if the percentage of plants that are infected is over a certain threshold that depends on the country, the entire plot must be eradicated. So this is very concerning for farmers. And um, it is concerning because the wine market in Europe it has a very big chunk of importance from the money perspective. And also, if you look at the graph, that's a projection of, that was made in 2016 of what we expect Flavescence Dore to be in the next year. Well, the, the number of plants, of plots that are going to have uh, and to be infected is exponentially increasing. So this is a, a big concern. And uh, we don't have alternatives to manage the vector besides, at the moment, insecticide. So there are no behavioral manipulation strategies. The only possible way is vibrational mating disruption. So it's what Valerio has been working on and developing in the last years in, uh, in Trento. Given all that, so going back to what they found on the use of semiochemicals in the field, we thought maybe the vibrations, since the insect is spending most of its time on the plants and the plants are vibrating, maybe this is affecting also other behavior of the insect, like flight and oviposition. And our hypothesis is that if we start vibrating the plants, probably they will be stressed and they will try to find another plant, so fly more. And if they fly more, they spend more, less time on the plant, also the females will lay less eggs on the wood. So to investigate this, uh, we performed some behavioral trials in the lab. Uh, we used some platforms, uh, vibrational plates, <laughs> we call them, um, that actually CBC built for us, uh, that are able to vibrate and shake the entire plant, uh, so that the threshold of the disturbance noise was well above the threshold that we know is effective to disrupt mating on all the leaves of the plant we were testing. Uh, and we tested males alone in silence, males together with females in silence, and then males and females in presence of the disturbance noise. And we counted the number of flights, like recording with a video camera, we counted the number of flights that each individual, male and females, were doing during the trial for 40 minutes. Whereas for the reposition activity, we use the same system of vibrating the entire plant in a greenhouse setting, and we isolated uh, the females inside this um, sleeve on the plant, uh, where we put inside all like mated females in silence or virgin females as a control, and mated females with the vibrations. And we were giving them an reposition substrate because they need at least a two year wood uh, stick to lay the eggs. And we changed the, the shot every two, five, and five days to see if there was a trend also during time, a change during time. What we found is that if we look at the total number of flights, of course, males fly more. This is not um, surprising because we know from the biology of the insect that males are the ones that perform the call and fly behavior, and so usually they're the more active and the more willing to, to move around. And in fact, the males that are not in presence of a female and without the vibrations fly more. But if we add the female, this decrease, but if we add the female and the vibrations, they start to fly with the same amount of time as uh, the males without the female. So we think that this is because the male is not perceiving the female anymore, uh, either because she stopped replying or because 
it can like the the perception is disrupted, and so it keeps calling and performing the call and fly behavior. But we see an effect also in the females that were exposed to vibrations that started to fly more compared to females in silence. For the reposition, we checked the number of eggs that were laid uh, inside the wood at the stereoscope at a different time. And we saw that during uh, time there is an effect, so time is important because at the beginning, so in the first two days after mating, they actually do not lay eggs. But when they start laying eggs, the number is reduced if the female is exposed to vibration compared to females that were in silence. So we conclude that we basically found out that our hypothesis were right. So if the plant is shaking, they, both males and females tend to fly more and the females lay less eggs. And this is important because Probably the increased flight activity explained the higher number of, of captures that Imani was telling you before that we found in the vineyards with the mating disruption with vibrations. And considering that this is the system people usually use to assess if there is the insect and the density of the population is important to know that if you see an increased number when you apply vibrations, it's not because the population is increasing, probably it's just because it's increasing their flight activity. It doesn't mean that the population is increasing. Also, if they stay less on the plant, if they fly more, probably they're also feeding less. And this for a vector species is very important because the transmission efficiency of the vector is related to the quantity of feeding. But Valentina will tell you more about this because she deepened the, the issue and so she has very interesting results to show you about it. And the observed reduction in laid eggs may lead to a lower fecundity. Uh, and this, it's very important because this means that even if they mate, so even if there are parts of the vineyard that are not over the, above the threshold, and they find a way to mate, we can still rely on this method to keep under control the population. However, <laughs> as always in research, or as often in research, this was just a starting point and it opened up a lot of questions that now we would like to address. For example, we just tested the flight activity in the moment of the day when Scaphodeus is more active, so when it's actually looking for a mating partner at dusk. But what happens during the rest of the day? Like, do they fly more during also the other moment of the day? And uh, if they do, and so the flight activity is increased a lot, can this make them face an energetic trade-off? And so they have to allocate the energetic resources in a different way. And maybe this could also affect their survival rate, for example, and the presence of the insect in the field for a, less, uh, a shorter period of time. And then we don't know, we just looked at the females for eight days after the mating, but they actually can live up to a month. So it's also possible that they retain the eggs because maybe waiting for a better substrate to lay the eggs, and then when they found something that vibrates less, they deploy everything, all the eggs that they have in that moment, so that they recover the numbers of eggs. Uh, we need to test it. But even so, uh, at least in Lepidoptera, we have seen that a delay, a shift in the moment in which the eggs are laid in the field can affect the survival rate of the eggs. So this maybe can be enough, even if they recover. What happens to other leaf hoppers? Uh, Iman mentioned that the system is not active only on Scaphoidus titanus, but also on other species like M. cavitis. So what happens to the other leaf hoppers? It, it, do, they have, do they experience the same effect or not? Uh, and it will be very convenient to have a mathematical model to help us in predicting the output 
of this kind of application because it's very difficult to do area-wide experiment. Uh, so a mathematical model could help in predicting what is the effect and also like putting together more strategies in an integrated pest management view. For example, meeting disruption for the first years together with the insecticide treatments. And then with the model, you know, when you can actually take out the insecticide and rely just on the meeting disruption system. So this is all work that has to be done. The paper was actually published this year, so if you want to know more, this QR code will lead you immediately to the page of the, the paper. Uh, but of course, I will take questions, and Valentina, I'm sure, also <laughs> will be uh, glad to discuss about it later. And I would like to acknowledge all the people that actively help us, all the technicians that were came with us in the field, or people that built the instruments we used, uh, the funding, of course. But I would like to take also a few seconds, if I have them, to thank also all the people of our lab that increase and enrich the discussion in every time also during like relaxing times and also all of you because I think that this kind of conference the biotermology conference is one of the most uh, of the best conference I usually go and that I like to come back and conferences are made of people so if the, pandem the pandemic told us something is that in research, we need uh, discussion and we need to be together to build a community. So thank all of you, each one of you, to take the time to came, come here and uh, be together. Thank you. So it's, uh, bumblebees uh, because uh, this is uh, uh, invasive species. So that's why uh, uh, we are studying uh, this uh, aspect of uh, the vibrations. And uh, uh, so what is more? So what? So we are uh, seeking the, the proximate factors that cause, cause reduction of white price. So, uh, as Barilio and uh, uh, other colleagues studies uh, the behaviors of the white flies, so uh, we will have to uh, study the uh, similar things, uh, such as uh, disturbance in mating signals and reduction of position and delay in developmental stages. So uh, that's it. So, uh, so uh, I, I'd like to express my uh, uh, appreciation to uh, many members uh, all members of the research uh, group and uh, uh, other staffs. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, my, uh, so thank you for my attention. That's it. Thank you, Haruki, your talk.